when you go to today's today's page, like I said, it's under the unit exercises, and we're going to download the color theory layouts. The first one we're going to do is this JPEG, color schemes. We're going to open this up in Photoshop. What I've done is I've given you a color wheel you can work with, and I've given you the start of some color swatches to work with. You're going to fill it out based on the color swatches that I've given. So let's drag this down into Photoshop. We'll work right on these color schemes. Let's see, I was working on that one earlier. Close that one out. Don't save it. Cool. The two um, tools that we're going to be working with are going to be your paint bucket. By the way, if you don't see your paint bucket, it may be hiding underneath your gradient tool. And we're also going to use the eyedropper tool. Remember, the paint bucket allows you to fill in common colors that are around each other. The eyedropper tool allows you to pick out colors. When you choose your paint bucket, here's what you got to know. First of all, set your tolerance to 20. You don't want this to go all over everywhere, so lower your uh, tolerance outlook, output. The other is be sure continuous is checked. You want that to be checked off. If it's not checked and it's uh, turned on like this, I've got blue filled in. If I go in to fill in a color, what's going to happen? It's going to go all over everywhere. It's going to look for everything on the page that's, that's uh, white and fill that in. If I check on continuous, it's only going to stay continuously inside of that area. So make sure that that's checked off as well. Uh, here's another great tip. I've got my paint bucket. Rather than going back and forth and selecting colors with my eyedropper, if I hold down my option key, watch what happens to my cursor. Holding down option will give me my eyedropper. When I let go, it goes back to my paint bucket. So I can quickly swap back and forth between those just by hitting that one, uh, one little button, back and forth. And I can pick my colors based on that. Cool. Here's one last thing. We ran into this uh, last class period. Watch what happens. I've got my eyedropper tool. Oops, excuse me. If I click on a color, which swatch fills up? Foreground color swatch. That one right there. That's the one we want. That's what we're going to be filling in. Every once in a while, this will happen. Now watch what happens when I fill it in. Which one's changing? It's my background color swatch. If that's happening, this is what you need to do. Open up your color swatches and click on that foreground color swatch. You can actually see it gets selected right there. In other words, it's uh, selecting just for that color swatch. Make sure that one's clicked off. Okay, back to what we're doing. So, if I've got a monochromatic and I've given you the color red, what colors do I need to swap, uh, select for that one? Red, what kind of red? Tints and shades of red. Here's the thing I want you to do. I'll write this on the board. I want you to give me lighter and darker shades. So you've got light, mediums, and darks. If I was picking out colors, I would try to pick between one or two of, of each one, light, medium, and dark. Now, you've only got five, so give yourself one or two of whatever is on here. Two lights, two darks, and at least a medium to work with. So this red is a nice medium red, probably around that color scheme. If I was to pick it, let's choose some lighter ones. Don't want to stay with white, and also let's pick some darker ones. Make sense? Two lights, two darks, and got my medium right there. Complementary. So what's a complementary of blue? Orange. Orange. That blue is right about here. It doesn't have to be perfect. I'm holding down my option. So going across, give me some, maybe some lighter blues, maybe a light orange, and maybe some darker oranges and darker blues to work with. There's a complementary color scheme. Cool? Blues and oranges. Split complementary. Analogous. Warm colors. Hey, warm colors. What are warm colors? Reds, yellows, and oranges. Anything that's on that warm color spectrum. Again, I don't want to have two colors that are too close. Those are a little bit too close to each other. Give me a lighter version of it. Let's even get lighter. Come on. There we go. Give me some that are darker. Give me some real darks. So all of these are nice warm colors that I could work with. Lights and darks for each. Um, warm colors. Cool colors obviously are the things that are on the cool side from here. Is anybody colorblind, by the way? Have issue? Saying? If you are, I, this will be a little bit difficult. Let me know. I can help you through it. 
Uh, bright colors. Bright colors and dark colors are probably the only ones you're going to need to just uh, forget about what I set up there. Keep everything bright, but give me a variety of colors to choose from. Keep everything dark for your dark colors. On this column, we kind of get into some of the um, some of the other ones that you know there, there's no color theory behind them. There's more social um, constructs around it. What do you, what do we consider boy colors? Blues, reds, yeah. What about girl colors? Pinks, purples, those types of things. Um, my wife and I are trying to decorate our, our nursery in neutral colors. What's gender neutral colors? Yellow. Yellows, orange, green, lots of, um, lots of gray and white, those types of things. So those are what, we, what you would choose. But for boy colors, traditional boy, traditional girl colors. Ooh, what's a tetrad? We didn't talk about that one. Four colors. So instead of a triad being three colors on the color wheel, in this case it's um, it's doing something like this. So you'd have orange, purple, blue, green, and yellow green. It's usually equal distance on there, or it's uh, evenly spaced out. So a tetrad would be four across. Remember, give me lights and darks. Uh, ooh, what are candy colors? What do you think of for candy when you reds? What candies come to mind for colorful candies? Nerds. Candy canes, nerds, Skittles, M&Ms, Sweet Tarts, <laughs> all those things. All those are good. Earth tones, so those are your, your dirt colors and your trees and your, uh, even the sky. Sky can technically be an earth tone. Uh, food tones, what comes to mind for colorful foods? Salad. Salad? Okay, <laughs> such as? Like what goes into a salad? Tomatoes, Tomatoes reds. So all your vegetables, you've got fruits. Skin tones. Skin tones are another thing that a lot of people have difficulty with. Good skin tones are usually in the uh, light oranges to dark reds, sometimes even to the blue or purple, depending on your shadow, <coughs> excuse me, on the shadows that you're working with. But again, give me lights and darks for each one on this one. Cool? Real, real simple. All you're doing is using your fill bucket and eyedropper to pick those up. <clears throat> Here's the second thing. Second in exercise is the color layouts. And this one we're going to be working in InDesign. I've given you, I'll scroll to the top, an image and the same layout for each one. Also, on the bottom uh, right-hand side, I'm giving you a color scheme to work with. Use that image to create a color scheme to colorize everything that's black on here. This includes the text, not the white text. So there's monochromatic, there's complementary, you've got triads, uh, use only the colors within the photo. Use an analogous color scheme. And again, I want to see lights and darks. So here's how we're going to set this up. For this one, we're going to use the eyedropper tool. If you don't see it, it's probably hiding under your measure tool. With the eyedropper tool, we can select a color that's inside of here. So if I had to make this monochromatic, what do you think would be an appropriate color? Green. Why green? Yeah, it's, it's the most dominant in the picture. I could easily do it with the orange. I could pull up some of these browns. I think green would be most appropriate. So to pick a color, hold down the Option key, and you'll see why. If I hold down my Option, I can pick the color, and it fills in my little Fill Color swatch right here. Here's what happens if you don't hold down the Option. If I click on it, notice how it turns um, the eyedropper is black, and it's shifted over to the other side. If I did that, I could go over to an, uh, an element and drop it into there. N there's nothing wrong with that. However, this is the concept I want you to pick up. When you select your color, I want you to save it as a swatch. And so I'm going to open up my fill color swatch, double clicking, and from here I can add the CMYK swatch. Click on that. By the way, I absolutely hate InDesign's color picker. It's the worst of all the software we use. It's not intuitive. But here's your CMYK swatch that you can add to it. I can now go up to my drop-down menu of swatches and there it is saved within there. I've got my green. <laughs> if I need to have lighter and darker tints and shades, here's a, here's a little tip. The little L right here under lab, this will allow you to use your slider to pick lighter and darker versions of it. So you don't have to hunt and peck it from right here. The L will give you that type of um, control over that. So I need some lighter and darker. So there's there's a lighter, we'll add that one. Maybe we'll add that one. Let's get some darker. 
Here's a dark and not quite black. We'll add that one. Just that easy, I've gotten four different color swatches. Actually, yeah, there we go. Five different color swatches I can pull from. Now it's simply a matter of, let's say open up uh, swatches so I can see what I'm working with. Simply a matter of selecting the elements and colorizing them. And all I've got to do is choose those elements to work with. Choose the background, highlight my text. I could have made it more green, but it works, right? Why does it work? Well, because I use the photograph that's with there. It works because I stuck to one color theory. I limited my color palette. Let's check out the second one. So if this is going to be a complementary color scheme, what complementary do you think would be appropriate? I can see two right here. Red and green. Red of his shirt, green of the background. Y'all see the other complementary? Blue and orange. The blue of her shirt and got a little bit of orange going on in the background back there. Give me some lights and darks for those. Here's one that a lot of people had. Uh, there's, there's triad. Ooh, they, yeah, this is difficult. Those are nice muted colors, but what colors are there? Got blue, got a little green. What else do you see? Got some pink, some red right there, maybe even an orange if you want to get into there. Um, colors of the photo was good. Analogous. So what is analogous? What's an analogous color scheme? They're adjacent, exactly. They're close to each other. What um, if orange, excuse me, not orange, if purple is my main color, I need to choose colors that are analogous to purple. So it's okay to go as far as red or down to blue. Don't make all of your colors exactly the shades of purple. Get some more red in there. Get some more blue in there. So if I was to choose those colors, grab my there, hold down option and click. Load it up. There's more of a blue type that I can get into. Hey, I could even go as far as that. Get lighter and darker. I can go all the way up to my reds. Pick some reds colors out of there. But remember, keep them lighter and darker when you choose the colors you're working with. Don't want it to be the same, same intensity, same value. Any questions on these first two exercises? You're picking swatches and you're putting them to, putting them to use. I'll turn your computer back over to you. I'll pause this. For this third one, we're going to be working under the flower, flower, flower Flyer folder. Say that three times fast. Mm -hmm. This Flower Flyer has 50 photographs. Um, only has these three photographs. And we're going to recolor each one that we're working in. If you notice the setup, the Flower Flyer has a Lynx photo. And these are where all the JPEGs that we're working with. So each flower is inside of, of there. What we're going to do is to change the color for each one using a different method to work with. So the first method that I've got on your second page is the gradient map method. Here's the thing you need to know first. To open up an image, I need to edit this image into Photoshop. Here's the quick and easy way of doing it. We want to click on the little circle in the center. This allows me to, to select the photograph, not just the frame. With the photograph selected, I can hold down Control and click on it, I get my pop out, and we want to edit this with, there's Photoshop. Usually by default, Photoshop is what we want to work with. So we're going to open this up in Photoshop. What it's done is it's opened up that flower JPEG into Photoshop to allow us to work. Did I lose everybody? Basic, basic stuff. Let's look at our layers palette. What we're going to do is we're going to add what's called an adjustment layer to this photograph. If you don't see your adjustments, they're usually over here on the uh, right-hand side. You can find it under your window drop-down menu. I'll pull this one out so we can see it. These adjustments allow you to tweak whatever layer is below it. Remember, Photoshop is layer-based editing. The one we're going to use is this one at the very bottom right-hand corner. When I click on it, you can see what happens to that one. What happened to my photograph, first of all? How the colors change? What have I got? Got analogous, but what happened to it? It's turned red, it's turned yellow, right? Also, what happened, my uh, properties palette. I'll open up my properties so we can work with it. Here's how the gradient map adjustment works with your photograph. Every place that's dark on here turns whatever color I've got on the left side. Everything that's light 
turns whatever is on the right hand side. So if I turn off that layer of visibility, you can see all the dark areas turn nice and red, and all the lighter areas got to this kind of uh, muddy, muddy orange uh, type color to work with. So what we want to do is we want to change the colors to fit what we need. To do that, just click on in your properties, your gradient editor, and here's the sliders that we can work with. So if I double click on any one of them, usually you want this one to be your dark edge. and We're going to make it darker blue. So if I chose blue, you can see it's starting to change. We'll go down to here. See how nice that looks? Dark blue to a light. If I chose a lighter blue, double click on that one. And it can be whatever color that you want. So if I choose light blue, there's a light blue. It can be something like this. I'll leave it up to you, but keep it nice and white from here. Do you understand what the that adjustment is doing? It's mapping out the lights and the darks. By the way, if you happen to swap it up, notice you can also move these around to see uh, the amount. If you swap it up, you get that negative type of effect. That's what's going on with that. The lights become dark, dark becomes light. And you can change these around. You don't have to be stuck with two swatches. If I added a third swatch in the center, I can even edit that one and I can assign another color to those. So I can pull in some red to those. For this one, we're just going to keep it with the, uh, the three swatches all in the blue family to there. Maybe even make this one a little bit white for this one. All cool? Real, real simple. Gradient map is a great, simple way, and it affects the entire image that we're working on. If I only wanted part of it, I notice I've got a layer mask. I can mask out the areas that I didn't want uh, that to affect. But I've got my color changed to blue. I'm in Photoshop. I need to save this as a JPEG. So the next important thing to remember is we need to flatten our image. To flatten it, there's two places you can go. The quickest way is at the top of your layers palette on the right-hand side there's our flattened image and that will create just the one layer. The other way you can do it, you can go up to layer and down at the very bottom there's flattened image. does the same thing. I think that's what I did in your instructions. Now when I save it, file and save, got it saved up, I can close this out. Let's close this one out as well. When I jump back into InDesign, check out what happened. It updated it. So whatever you changes you make, when you jump into InDesign, it updates and that's what we're working with from there. Pretty cool. That's the gradient map method. Very, very simple, easy, easy thing to do. Here's the second method. This one is the color blending mode change. I told you you can do this one in any of the software. Let me show you how to do it in InDesign first. Changing the blending mode means changing how the pixels interact with either objects or layers. What are some blending modes you remember? Y'all remember what those were? Intro people? What do I mean by blending mode or transparency mode? It's part of it. It's related. Is it like the ones where you can like darken or lighten? Bingo, darken, lighten, multiply, all of those. I'm going to make just a regular rectangle and put it on top of here. And let's fill it in with a solid color. Uh, let's make it green. So under normal circumstances, my blending mode is just going to cover up whatever I have. If I open up my transparency palette, here's where I can change my blending mode. There it is for normal. So if I choose any other type, this will allow me to change the color and how those colors interact. One of the better ones to change the color is either color or hue. And so if I needed to change the hue of that color, the blending mode is now set to color. When I say OK, all I've got to do is to place an a object with a different blending mode and different color over it and that way I've changed the color of it. Pretty cool? Let's do the same thing in Photoshop. So I'm going to just delete the other way. Remember to open this in Photoshop, we need to click on the center part, control click, and then edit with Photoshop. It'll open up this one. Photoshop is layer based, so we need to actually make a layer based on the uh, color that we're working with. Rather than making a new layer and then grabbing my fill bucket and filling it in, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to layer, New fill layer, we're going to fill it with a solid color this way. Here's the reason I like to use these. It's going to ask you for a name. We'll say OK to that. From here, check out the type of layer that I have. A fill layer gives you the option to be able to change up whatever color you need. So if I needed to quickly select a green, I can work with it. If I need to change it, all I've got to do is double click on that and then change the color that I want 
from there. I don't have to use a fill bucket. I don't have to worry about clicking continuous or right space. Fill, solid fill color works with that one. So I've got it there. I believe in the instructions I'm going to ask you to change the blending mode for this one to hue. And that's the way it should look for here. There's hue blending mode. Hey, here's color blending mode. You can see the two differences between those two. Hue will give us those nice uh, grays in the background, only changing up the hue of that photograph. Did I lose everybody? Okay. If I need to save it as a JPEG, I need, which means I need to flatten these layers, how do I flatten an image? No, 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 no. You can go up to layer, there's flatten right there. Or I can go to the top of my layers palette, and there's flatten since I've already done it out from there. We'll save it up. Let's jump back into InDesign, and there it is changed up under InDesign. Just that easy as well. The layer blending mode tends to be a great, great way of quickly changing stuff up from the other one. Here's another fancy one. This one is primarily done in InDesign, though we need to work in Photoshop as well. Open this one up in Photoshop. So, control click, edit with, get a new photo. This time, Right now I'm working in RGB color mode, which means all of my colors are some selection of red, green, and blue. What I really want is just shades of black and white. I'm going to convert this to a true grayscale. And to do that, I'm going to go to Image, Mode, and you can see I can change things to CMYK for printing or for indexing. Grayscale is what we want for this one. It's going to ask me, are you sure you want to discard it? We'll say discard. Now I've got what's called the true black and white. Uh, this means the printer is not going to recognize the red, greens, or blues, or the uh, CMYK. It's going to recognize just shades of black and white. Here's We're going to use that to our advantage. This time, the, for this one, we're not going to save it as a JPEG. We need to save as a TIFF format. The TIFF format tends to be preferred by publishers because it's a lossless format. Whenever I save a TIFF, I'm not going to lose any information to compression like you would a JPEG. If you keep saving a JPEG over and over and over again, it's going to lose quality. If you've ever seen like a, an image that's been downloaded a bunch of times, that's what's happening to it. It's, it's becoming much more grainy. We'll talk more about that when we get into um, mocking up websites. I'm saving as a TIFF. TIFF also saves all of the black and white images. Hit save, we'll just say okay to that, and I'm going to close it out from here. What's going to happen when I jump into here? Nothing. It didn't change it to black and white. Why didn't it change to black and white? It's not a JPEG. It's not the same file. I need to drop in that new file that I saved. So, place, there we go. There's my flower TIFF that I created. Now it's black and white. Here comes the magic. Here comes the magic trick that I'm about to do. I've got my box selected. What's my fill color for my box? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Got a null color. Let's give it a color. I'm going to give it green. Okay, what just happened? How did it get colored? Monochromatic. It's monochromatic, but what happened? What became green in my photo? The lights. The, lights. the white pixels in this area became whatever color of my bounding box. In this case, it's green. So if I need to change the darker pixels, I'm going to select the picture. Click on the little spot in the center. Check out what my fill color is for my picture. It's black. So if I change this color to something else, and we'll get wild, we'll do hot pink. Hot pink is now filled in there. Let's give it some we can actually see. Let's do red. See, now red becomes the fill color. The color of the picture is the darks. The color of the bounding box is the lights. And I believe for this one, what are we going to do? For the, uh, the image, it needs to be magenta. So let's give it a, kind of a hot pink magenta. And for the, we're going to deselect it. For the inside of it, we're going to make that yellow. So there's my hot yellow. And so that's the way that will look from there. Making it lighter and darker, we'll give you that. What's that? Excuse me. So there you go. Three different methods of changing a color. You're changing the gradient map, the blending mode, or you're making it grayscale and changing out the lights and darks to work with that from there. Questions on this exercise? Okay. I'm going to stop recording.